horns have been cut before, but now one of them is regrowing and actually growing into his skull. On this week's Bondi Vet Top 5. Trimmer bird's beak is usually a once in a lifetime event. <laughs> okay. It's okay. For Carrie to hear there might potentially be some drilling going on through Coda's skull. That's going to be a, a pretty tough thing for her to swallow. Number five. Hey Karen, how are you going? Good, oh, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right. I should be about 10 minutes away. Chris is in far north Queensland to check out a bizarre animal emergency. I'll see you in your ball soon. Oh, thank you. See you a passionate plea for help from a small community is taking him to Machen's Beach, just outside of Cairns. If even half of what I've heard about this bull is true, then this is just an amazing story. According to Karen, he was washed over a waterfall during raging floodwaters and somehow came ashore at this beach. It was 1999 when Cyclone Rona unleashed her fury and caused catastrophic flooding. Herds of cattle were washed away. Most drowned. Now, it seems like this lucky survivor is now facing another life-threatening challenge. And that's why I'm here. So this is a legend, huh? I'm oh, Karen. Hi, how nice are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hello, big guy. This is Bully. Around these parts, you'd think the tourist attractions are the Great Barrier Reef for the Daintree Rainforest. Bully pulls a crowd around here. People will pull up just to have their photos taken with Bully. For 13 years, Bully's been kept alive by the generosity and love of the locals. He gets mangoes in the mango season. People bring down hay for him. He, he gets molasses, um, loves bread. We've just been concerned about this horn that's growing sideways into his head. His horns have been cut before, but now one of them is regrowing and actually growing into his skull. Not nice for him, and I think eventually it's going to cause him a lot of grief. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I mean, so if it isn't already. That's yeah, a... probably giving him headaches and stuff now. Yeah. Kiss me on the neck. I think he's in love. <laughs> <laughs> Never had a ball so quickly attracted. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that means? He's attracted to you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so when he does it, he gets right up there, it's called flamen, and he's trying to put the pheromones into the back of his nostrils, and it means that he wants to breed with me. Then you take that. A little look here. Yeah, wow, that's really pressing in. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I hey, just mate. feel really sorry for him. The more it pushes in, the more pressure it causes, eventually it'll actually start pushing into his skull, into his brain, and that could kill him. My hope is if I can actually sedate him, mm then I might be able to get a wire in there and actually start chopping. Like a garrote type yeah, wire? Yeah, yeah. But the, the thing is, I want to be quick. The minute you start sort of putting any pressure on that, he's going to burr up with it, yeah. you know? In Machen's Beach, the real Chris Brown is coming up with a plan to save Bully. The community pet's life is being threatened by a horn pressing into his skull. My plan for Bully is really to win him over using a few special little treats that locals tell me he really likes. If I can do that, get him liking me, then maybe I might be able to get that injection in. And from there, he'll be sedated enough so I can actually saw that horn off. The crowd's building. So is the pressure on Chris. Oh, yes. I mean, he's under the microscope. <laughs> I reckon I can kill him, which is pretty scary, so something needs to be done. I'm just going to aim for that muscle in his neck there. It's a really delicate balance between giving him too much or giving him too little and having him run off into the bush and never see him again. He's gone. I didn't give him quite enough to actually sedate him. He's taken off into the bush. He's pretty cagey, Chris, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Really, if I keep on pushing with Bully today, we run the real risk of him losing trust in everyone around here. So it's probably right to back off a little bit, come up with a new game plan, and try to do it properly. You won round one, absolutely, hands down. But you see, I've got a few things that I reckon are going to go in my favour. Chris is in Machen's oh Beach, just outside Cairns, to help community pet Bully. The bullock's horn is pressing into his brain and needs to be removed. I'm calling him the heavy artillery. Boys, this might be just a trick, I reckon. So we've got a few people to help us out, a few the locals. G'day, guys. Hey, hey thank doing? you. Tony and Tom have volunteered to assemble a cattle pen. We put this one in the corner there. 
Yep. It seems everybody in this community is willing to help. Perfect. The moment that injection goes in, he clearly becomes a little bit nervous and takes off for the bush. Now, that just can't happen if we give him a high dose. It's going to be dangerous for him and it's no good for us. So now it's up. Let's have to get him in here. I know. The hard part is getting him to trust us because I think probably the last time he was in yards was when he was, you know, with, at the butchers ready to go to the abattoirs before the, before the big floods. You take that, then you turn around, don't make eye contact. Come on. Come on. Quick. Come on, bully. Quick. Come on, bully. Come on. Hey, there Good we go. Good boy. And see, then we'd shut. Good lad. We won't do it now. I just really think we've got to concentrate on getting him comfortable, happy in yeah. here, relaxed, so he doesn't think that this is a trap. You watch, he'll turn around now and, and take off. Yeah, see? Let's go on. Chris will now give Bully 24 hours to get used to the yards. I need him to feel comfortable in this space because when it comes to giving him that anaesthetic, if he is on edge, if he's looking to escape, he's going to need such a high level of drugs that that becomes dangerous. The whole neighbourhood has turned out to make sure the kid from the big city looks after their boy. It's coming, bully. It's Look coming. It in. I couldn't sleep last night because I thought if this doesn't work today, what are we going to do? You know, where do we go from here? You know, the next thing would be euthanasia because yeah, he couldn't couldn't live like that. I reckon the plan of attack should be get his favourite food, lead him into the yard, I have the syringe in my hand, walk up around to his neck there, little pat, jab, and then out. It's okay, Bully. It's okay, buddy. It's all right. The thing that worries me the most about Bully is the fact that he's a Brahmin. Now, this breed is notorious for not liking to be in confined spaces. Add an injection to that, and he could quite likely try to climb out of the yard. If I'm in the way, he could go over the top of me. Well done, Chris. He's moved just after I've, I've injected and, and bent the needle, but I'm pretty sure it's all gone in there. The sedation appears to be working, but Chris has to be sure. The rather sobering reality is the fact that Bully could need another injection. Now we see me do one of them. The second one, so much harder. This time, Chris is using a dart pole to inject the drug. It's OK, mate. It's all right. That's gone in, and as he's tried to kick me, it's bent the needle. But the important thing is all that drug actually got into the muscle. Until it's over and he's back on his feet, then we're a bit nervous. Yeah, that's human nature. But he means a lot to us. Sleeping us here? Bully is finally asleep, and Chris can get on with the job of removing the horn that's growing into the side of his head. There we go. Oh, you're much longer, buddy. You're being good, buddy. <laughs> OTM, over the moon. <laughs> yeah. It's just such a relief, such a relief. Hey, look here. Well done. You can actually see where the horn's been pressing in. It's been a constant migraine for him. It's probably bored him. Another 10 years of life. It's great. You've done a great job. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a hot day. He's had a lot of anaesthetic drug into his system. It's going to take a long time to wake up. In all that time, he's lost that ability to, to cool down. So he needs extra help. We're going to call them the big guns. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Steady, bully. Steady. Steady. That's great. We can get him standing up in the next hour or so. I'll be happy. We did it. <laughs> You've slept it off, surely, haven't you? Two hours later, and Chris is back to see where the bully has recovered from his major procedure. Come on, bully. Come on, bully. Big stretch. Come on, bully. Big stretch. Go, bully. Go, bully. Oh, you're an athlete. Yay. You are an athlete. <laughs> oh, dear. Bully's up and up and away. No. This one's for you, bully. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I might just make a toast to all the Matron's Beach community here who have taken a rather flirtatious bullock under their wing and shown him a lot of love. The really amazing thing for me is that the people up here, they're surrounded by this incredible beauty of the Great Barrier Reef and these long sandy beaches with palm trees, but the real beauty here is within these people. And the love they show to these animals, these battlers like Bully, it's pretty special. Thank you and cheers. Cheers, cheers boy. Number four. Whenever I'm in Melbourne, I always take time out to see someone who I think is pretty special. Pam Ahern is essentially the patron saint of animals and she always needs a vet. Chris has arrived at Edgar's Mission, a sanctuary for homeless animals about an hour's drive from Melbourne. Hey Pam, how are you? Good, thanks Chris. Thanks so much for coming. That's alright, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. How are you going? Now what's on today? We've got quite a bit on today. Burpee the pig needs a bit of a tusk trim. Yeah. Gretel the little three-legged calf's grown and she needs her foot trim. So we've got quite a big day for you. I didn't doubt it. <laughs> Who's up first? Uh, we'll do Burpee the pig, eh? Alright. For most people, just a couple of pets are a big ask and take up a lot of time, but Pam has over 300, all coming from really tough backgrounds. So for me to come along here and treat the odd pig, the odd lamb or cow, I get a bit of a buzz out of it, but you know it's making such a difference to the animals here that really deserve that help. Well, we've got Burpee over here. That's, that's Burpee? That's Burpee. He's probably grown a little bit since you saw him last time. Oh, wow. Yeah. This was how Burpee looked when he last met Chris. He was just six weeks old. Now the cute porker is all grown up. Hello, Burp. How have you been eating, Burpee? Hello, you good pig? Hello. Hello, buddy. Yeah, you've changed just a little. You can see these farm pigs, they get quite big. And there's tusks. So this yeah. is the problem here, they're starting to Yeah, they're starting really to get quite big, and... yeah, and they're, they're quite pointy. Burpee's now 220 kilos of grunting muscle and knows that he has big tusks to use on any vet that comes near him. They're fair weapons. They are. I mean, you can see that they've really evolved to be great fighting tools, the angle that they grow out on. And this is our difficulty because he has a couple of friends in his paddock with him. He only has to just gently swing that head around and he can cut the other pigs. And even, you know, for us when we go in to feed him, because they do love belly rubs and pats and things like that. So um, we've got to think of our safety as well. The tusks are big, they're starting to curl around. So he obviously needs it done. Whether he knows that, not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the funny feeling that food might somehow be Burpee's friend. Yeah, it certainly is, yep. They're well-known pigs. Burpee has dangerously overgrown tusks that need to be trimmed. To sedate the 220 kilo pig, Chris has a cunning plan. With a big bowl of food in front of him, he'll be distracted enough, I'll be able to sneak up and put a little injection into his neck. You're hungry, aren't you? It's no wonder you've got that amazing figure, Burpee. Good boy. Hey, how good's this? Yeah, yummo. Hey, it's about to feel something. There we go. So now it's just a matter of getting this injection in nice and slowly while he's eating. And then once he's asleep, we can get in there and do these tusks. That might be easier said than done. Bed. 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 Come on. Thank you. Back to bed. Good boy. Oh, he's getting groggy, isn't he? Good boy. Good piggy. Oh, he's a good pig. He's a good pig. Oh, what a good pig. Oops. Missed the starting line. <laughs> Come on. Go. That's it, buddy. Good he's man. time to sleep. Let's go. Good boy. Just arranging the bed. So the plan is to get in there with the wire, being very careful that he is going to stay asleep and then start to shave those tusks away. It's incredibly dangerous, so we just have to make sure he is really and truly asleep. To it. There you are, sleeping off. At Edgar's mission, Burpee is now asleep and Chris is happy to start removing his dangerous tasks. So this one we've got to cut here. Geez, that's sharp. 
it's only now when burpees are asleep and I can actually feel those tusks with my own fingers that I realise just how sharp they are. They obviously need to come off. Getting them off though, might be tricky. The key here is just getting the wire in around this task and getting an initial cut because this doesn't really work that well otherwise. I reckon the drill sounds bad at the dentist. Oh wow, good job. I've got a feeling the one on the other side is even bigger. That means rolling over a 220 kilogram pig. This is not going to be simple. <laughs> Good pig. Good boy, Burpee. Good boy. Oh. Way to go, Burp. I think we got there. <laughs> we got there. It's about two inches long, so almost six centimetres with a really sharp point in it. Oh, bingo. Oh, that oh, it's one. a good one. <laughs> now that Burpee's done, Pam and all the volunteers here are going to be a lot safer. There's no doubt about that. Before Chris leaves Burpee to sleep off the sedation, he's got one final gift. Obviously, Burpee believes in the tooth fairy. Absolutely. I'm just... Stop me here, Burps. Didn't say anything. This week's number three. Jasmine, and this is Bubbles. Bubbles? She has a problem with her beak. Okay, oh, I can see it, wow. In the world of birds, trimming a beak, it's not uncommon, but at the same time, to trim a bird's beak is usually a once in a lifetime event. Oh, so that's not a normal beak. Notice how the colour of her beak there, it's quite yellow. Hey, that's not very nice. It's a bit... <laughs> Four-year-old Bubbles has been brought into the Bondi clinic by worried owner Jasmine and her father, Bob. Her beak's been, like, overgrowing. We've been cutting it, but it's just been growing back and back and back. Jasmine is desperate to get help for the little cockatiel. I'm worried that the beak, because it's long and sharp, it's going to go into her, like, throat area and kind of pierce her skin. There's going to be irreparable damage that could be fatal. It is someone chirping in here. Hello, how are Hi. you? Hi, I'm Jasmine and this is Bubbles. Bubbles? She has a problem with her beak. Okay, oh, I can see it, wow. It's pretty bad. All right, come straight through and we'll have a look for you. Looking at Bubbles, I'm thinking that beak, oh, it must be slightly overgrown. But, oh no, it's massively overgrown to the point where it's now starting to push into her neck. So this beak, I mean, it's obviously quite dramatic. Yeah. It's How quickly does that grow? Uh, last time we trimmed her beak was about last month. Okay. It grows really quickly. So just in a month that's happened? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's quick. In the world of birds, trimming a beak, it's not uncommon, but at the same time, to trim a bird's beak is usually a once in a lifetime event. For Bubbles, it's been quite different. So. I just want to learn a bit about Bubbles first. What does she eat? What's a good meal for her? Uh, she eats normal bird seeds and occasionally some fruit. Okay. So seeds are sort of most of her diet? Yeah, basically all of her diet. Right. And I can see that little cuttlefish in there. Does she yeah. chew on that a little bit? She occasionally chews on it, but she likes to poo on it more. Yeah. Yeah. That... yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how it looks. Jasmine's doing what just about every single person out there with a cockatiel does. She feeds bubble seeds. But just because everyone does it, doesn't mean it's the right thing. So at the moment, what I'm worried about is the fact that this beak could be only the beginning of her issues. For that beak to grow so quickly in a month, that's really, really quick. Yeah. You know, it's, it'd be like me, my fingernails, coming out to here in a month. Mm. You know, that doesn't seem right, does it? 12-year-old Jasmine has brought her much-loved cockatiel bubbles into the Bondi clinic. She's worried about the four-year-old's extremely overgrown beak. Well, Bubbles, it's time for you and me to get to know each other a bit more closely. Oh. OK. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi.
appreciate your art, but... I thought we were gonna have like a little bonding moment there after you, I heard you like men. Now I have Bubbles firmly in my grasp, it's time to have a proper look over her. These little love bites. Bubbles is trying to bite me, but that beak of hers being so overgrown just means she can't get the end of her beak onto my finger, which means I'm safe for now. Unfortunately though, I'm not sure Bubbles is. Oh, so that's not a normal beak. Little bits are crumbling off, just shouldn't do that. A bird's beak should be shiny and hard and really, really strong and really beautiful. And the other thing that's got me intrigued and a little bit worried as well is that when you look at her poos in there, notice how they've got that green area around the outside of them? That should have actually just been a white patch. Suddenly we're getting a look inside Bubble's life and her health, and it doesn't look good. The most dramatic thing for me is just notice how the colour of her beak there, it's quite yellow, and there's a lot of her that, that's very yellow. Every skin and beak surface of Bubble's is dry, it's flaky, but it's also yellow, and that's no different to someone that has jaundice. It's a sign that the liver is failing. It's the thing about birds, everything moves quickly. If they get sick, they get sick really quickly. So you've done just the right thing by bringing her in. Bubba's had this issue since she was three years old, and in that time, my feeling is that diet of seeds, all that fat has eventually worn out her liver, and now she has liver disease. So, what we need to do is look at what she's eating. Uh -huh. Because at the moment, she's not coping brilliantly with it and she just needs a bit of extra help. But I don't want you to freak out because I think this is actually something we can fix and fix together, okay? Uh -huh. Looking at Jasmine, I can tell this is news that's a bit of a surprise, but also a little bit hard to take because she's been doing everything through love and She's been doing everything she believes is right. So she kind of needs a bit of a liver detox. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll do it. <laughs> She's got to mix up a diet, yeah. eat clean, <laughs> get some extra greens into a diet, and, and just start to, I guess, have a more nutritious diet. Before I explain exactly how this liver detox is going to work, we better take care of that beak. That's looking pretty good. Got to a nice level there. So, let's talk about how dinner's gonna look for Bubbles now. <laughs> yeah. I want you to put some seeds on some cotton wool. Mm-hmm. And wet the cotton wool and let those seeds sprout. When it sprouts, it actually uses up most of the fat in the seed as well. So suddenly a seed transformed into being something that's really healthy mm -hmm. and low in fat. I have a diet in mind for Bubbles that is essentially gonna turn her life around. Between the sprouted seeds, the green leafy vegetables and the native plants, my feeling is that in a couple of weeks, her whole life should be looking a lot more rosy. So for her, we're changing her diet to make it healthy, reducing its fat, getting more vitamins and minerals in there, but also giving her more exercise. And if she does that, all of a sudden, her whole body's gonna kick back into action. Her liver's gonna have more of the good stuff coming in, which means it'll be able to get rid of those toxins, it'll be able to produce the proper proteins and all the different elements that her body needs. And also, if we can get everything else regulated and get that weight off, then the liver functions a bit more easily as well, it doesn't have the extra load on it. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So hopefully for Bubbles, it's gonna be a speedy recovery, she's gonna be healthy and active, and she's not gonna have like a problem like this anymore. I look forward to seeing the new Bubbles. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, no worries. Thank you. See you soon. See you. There's a real art to treating birds. The problems they get can come on very quickly and also kill them quite quickly. In Bubbles' case, I'm confident we've managed to get this situation in time. And the good news for Jasmine is that with the right treatment, there's no reason why she can't turn it around and be looking brighter and healthier in just a few weeks. Number two. Oh, come on. Dead. She's just had a bath. On Fiji's remote Matangi Island, 
Chris is being introduced really to his gargantuan patient, Miss Piggy. She doesn't like men. She just has never been keen on men. Miss Piggy, outside. Come on, come on, Piggy. I got more. Come. Come on, darling. Good girl. Piggy poo. Miss Piggy on, can hardly on, walk because of her badly Piggy, overgrown okay, nails. Cutting girl. them is Chris's intimidating Piggy. assignment. Come on, darling. If this cycle continues of her not being able to walk, of just eating and not exercising, she'll get so fat, it'll kill her. Oh, it's all right, darling. I, I can't cut nails in mud. Move it, move it, move it. Yes, yes. Would this little room here be better or take her inside? Meanwhile, Miss Piggy is finally on the move and about to be barricaded so Chris can try and cut her dangerously overgrown nails. It's okay. It's okay. Lie down. Butter and bread and jam, please. Whatever you got. Just eat slowly there, all right? Because we, we just can't keep up with you. Right, there's something in her mouth. She's distracted. Enough that I can actually get the shears in there and, and trim these nails. I'm with you. Well, you're a jolly good piggy. Eat all the biscuits and shut up. I'm with you. Keeping the food supply coming is the matriarch of Matangi Island, Christine's mum, Flo. We have to make sure that she doesn't bite. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Just take your little backside. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. You want Miss Piggy? Here's your bread. Oh, you bleeding. Christine got a really nasty bite. Miss Piggy's upper and lower incisors just pushed straight through her hand, punctured it, and went right through. Just get a towel. Get a towel. I think that's enough. You're nearly there, Mum. I'm not going to lose now, Piggy. I'm not going to lose. That was close. I nearly lost them. You're right, okay? Good point. Maybe Piggy. after all, it would be Piggy. a good outcome. Chris has survived his torrid nail cutting session with Miss Piggy. Done. Yay! How did I get talked into doing that? This is a tropical island with white sandy beaches, palm trees. You go on holidays here, you don't go to hell. And hell was what we just went to. We had fun, didn't we? Kind of, kind of cute. See you later. And this week's number one. When I had a call from Lynchy, who's an old vet mate of mine from uni, about Coda, I was blown away. He sounds like such an incredible little guy who's already been through so much. Chris is on his way to the outer Melbourne suburb of Yarrambat, where he will finally meet the famous Coda. In a few days' time, he's due to undergo a massive operation. I knew I had to be here and lend a hand. Looking a little bit sleepy this morning. My right, little guy, hey, want to go for a run? Coda was born a dwarf, a genetic disaster with very little hope of surviving. Hey Lynchy, how are you? Hey Chris, Mate, how good are to you? See you? Good to see you. Uh, you thanks. must be Karen. Uh, hi, nice Hello. to meet you. Yeah, thanks so much Karen for coming Stevens down. Right. Stepped in it means a lot. To Fantastic. Being put you know down. what, you are even smaller than I thought. <laughs> it just seemed like such a tragedy to end his life after only a few short weeks. He deserves a chance to be happy and if we can make that happen then it's worth every cent. What's that? A bit of smile? Yeah, I think he's so taken to you, Chris. Guy. He's very special. He's very special. He's amazing. Yeah. Can I actually have a good look at it, how, he, how he gets around? Is that all right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> he actually gets around all right, he does, doesn't, doesn't he? he? At only two years of age, Coda has already endured several major surgeries. You can see, though, how he limps there, Chris. Yeah. When he was still a baby, the fetlock joint on his left front leg had to be fused to stop it buckling. At last, he could finally yeah, stand up That's and right. walk. And he hasn't stopped running since. Go, go, go! I'd been told stories about Coda, I'd seen photos, I'd seen videos. But when you actually see him, it's a shock. He's tiny. He barely comes up to my knees. I've seen Labradors bigger than Coda. The list of Coda's medical problems and, and previous surgeries is bigger than he is. Hello, kids come to play. As Coda's reputation grows, so does his fan club. Andrew has invited Chris to their daily visit to a nearby preschool. So kids, Coda's just going into hospital to have an operation, so you've all got to give him the best wishes. <laughs> hey, good boy. With all this talk about operations, it's easy to forget about what Karen and Lynchy have done for Coda. It would have been easy for them to walk away 
and just have him put to sleep. But no, they stuck with him. They believed in him and made huge sacrifices. Karen's put off her house deposit just so she could be there and pay for all of Cutter's treatment. It's pretty amazing. Ready? Ready? We'll go Come on. two. Come on. It's really good, isn't it? <laughs> Cutter might come in a very small package, but at the same time, he, he has such a big effect on, on everyone that he meets, especially kids. He connects with them. They look at him eye to eye, and I think they see something really special. Is that a girl or a boy? It's a boy. Cutter, he's got a doodle. He's got a doodle. He does have a doodle, yes. <laughs> very, very observant, thank you. The pint-sized celebrity also carries out his own charity work raising money and doing regular rounds at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital. Uh, Lammy's gonna pat him. Lammy's gonna pat him. Oh. It's uplifting. It's fantastic to see the kids' reactions. It's just such a delight taking him in there and seeing the change that it makes to everyone's day in there. Not just the, the, the patients, um, but the patients, the children's parents and the staff of the hospital. I think he likes you. He wants to have a good rub. <laughs> Look at Pony. Oh, look, look. I think he's saying, you tickled me, now I'm going to tickle you back. But today, at the Yarrambat Clinic, it's time for Coda to become a patient once again. One of the quirks of dwarfism is that sometimes organs or parts of the body are the same size as they would be in a full-size animal. And with Coda, that's the case with his teeth. He's got full-size adult horse teeth inside that tiny skull of his. That tooth there is that big. That's right. Yeah, it's hard in, to imagine, isn't in it? In tiny coda. The thing that I find most scary about this x-ray is that it's just a, a head full of teeth that really obscure uh, him breathing in through his mouth, in through his nose. There's no real clear path for the air to get in or out. And for me, that, that, that really scares me. Everyone's experienced a toothache, but what Coda must be going through with multiple teeth penetrating into his sinuses, causing a pressure build-up, pressing on his eyes, pressing on his brain, it must be horrific. If we don't do anything about this soon, then it will kill him. Hello, man. You me brave for your surgery? The risky operation to remove the teeth is scheduled in three days. This will be Coda's biggest test. Life would be incredibly different without him and I think a lot of people would miss him terribly because he is a big part of everybody's life here. Inside the Yarrambat Clinic, Australia's smallest horse is busy raiding the staff lunches. Oh, Coda. Coda, you can't eat that. That's someone's lunch. Coda's happily unaware and will soon have to undergo major surgery to remove the massive teeth that are shutting off his air supply. It'd be nice to actually give something back to him, really make a difference to his life, remove that source of pain, remove that pressure, and actually make him happy again. Today's tracheostomy is step one of the risky procedure. By putting this tracheostomy tube into his windpipe and allowing him to breathe through it. We then free up space for the surgeons to go into his mouth, go into his sinuses and work their magic. Without that, there's just no way for him to breathe under anaesthetic. For me, it's amazing that he's actually got this far. There's two really large arteries, two really large veins and a really important nerve that are right next to where we need to be making this cut. So that's always gonna be the biggest concern. It's the really crucial part now. We actually need to cut into the windpipe. Then we place this tube in that space, and hopefully that's going to be the job done. Nice job. And we're in. That now becomes essentially his new new airway, his new way to breathe. All right, man, well, I'm happy. That's great. Perfect. Just going to drop me down in there. And there you go, buddy. Yeah. How's that, little buddy? Yeah. A wild ride, wasn't it? Him up so he's sort of in a sitting position. Okay. Oh, no, he's going to stand. <laughs> to clear out any blood from the tracheostomy tube, Chris needs to give Coda a good shake. But the little horse has had enough. Oh, you keep me right in there. Oh, really? Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Coda. That was nice. That was nice. I'm going to have legs looking like yours soon. 
Oh, man. How tough is Coda? It's an hour after the operation. Walked out to his barn, has a look around, looks at me and goes, mate, you did this. And hey, mate, well, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> I'm in awe of his toughness. But the reality is he's got a much bigger operation still to come. And I really hope he's up to it. We'll see you in a few days' time, Coda. See you, mate. See you, mate. Coda's very good this morning. He is breathing very well after his operation the other day. Three days later, Coda heads to the city with Andrew and Karen for the operation that will hopefully save his life. I can't help but be a bit nervous, I have to say. Yeah, I guess it is a bit like having a child going in for an operation. You, you do feel a large responsibility and you just hope that you're doing the right thing by him. He's, he's just got to get through today. Hey Lindsay, hey, hey Karen, how are you going? How are you? How's the trip in? Yeah, it was good. All right. Hey Big Ned, he's got a special ramp, does he? He does. The operation will take place at Advanced Vet Care in the Melbourne suburb of Kensington. Boy. It's, it's quite something. <laughs> yeah. You are very special, Lindsay. Yeah. It's a big day for you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Cool, buddy. An amazing amount of teeth in that small space. Absolutely, unfortunately, yes. Um, Associate um, Professor Gary Wilson, a specialist a horse dentist from Queensland, way. is doing the surgery uh, so for free. Trans it's right up there, we're doing wombats and koalas, okay, <laughs> for difficulty. <laughs> Can you see anything like okay. that? No, this is definitely a first for me. Yeah. <laughs> Associate Professor Andrew Heggie, an oral but and facial surgeon diet. at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital, is another volunteer on this elite surgical team. Well, I've been drawn into it because of the problems of the uh, you know, dwarf miniature pony and some of the problems related to the jaws and the teeth. Coda visits from time to time and uh, the children's eyes nearly pop out of their heads when they see him pottering by this uh, miniature horse that's actually alive and not a, a mechanical sort of uh, device. And uh, I think we want to keep him in good health for as long as we can for obvious reasons. If we can't access the tooth properly, or the tooth breaks in the process, we'll probably go to surgery. Uh, initially, we'll start by splitting the mouth on both sides. Um, if that doesn't work, we'll then go to a, what's called a buccotomy where we'll raise a flap off the side of the tooth and try and take it out sideways. Okay. And if that doesn't work, we'll then go in through the sinus, which means we drill a hole in his head uh, and go in that way. For Karen to hear there might potentially be some drilling going on through Coda's skull, that's going to be a, a pretty tough thing for her to swallow. The potential for catastrophe is great. One slip the wrong way or an anaesthetic complication and things could go disastrously bad. So that back edge is actually still molar one, molar two hasn't even erupted on this guy yet. Coda's complex operation to save his life has begun. Within a few minutes, Chief Surgeon Gary Wilson has to make a tough decision. First off here is I, I can't get my finger back to the tooth that I need to extract. So we're going to split him. I'm going to do a bilateral commissurotomy, which means basically I'm going to make him smile bigger, temporarily. <laughs> So mm. what I'll get you to do while I'm cutting is if you can stretch that for me, sure. that tightens that, which gives me a better cut. Yeah. Pretty drastic way to get a look at the teeth. It is certainly horrifying seeing him with his face split open, but um, no, he's all right. He's in good hands. Now we got access, because that's the tooth I need is one, two, three, four. Time to take a tooth out. I'm about to try and remove the gum from the teeth that are affected. So that's what that's for. The first molar on the top jaw on both sides has to come out. At the moment we're just trying to make a bit of space around the tooth we want to remove. It's everything, everything is just so jam-packed up there that 
really space is golden. And when using these instruments just to try to lever around a bit of room and, and hopefully once you've done that, you're going to be able to start working that tooth out. The surgical team has now reached the critical moment. If any of Coda's teeth break off, Gary will have to drill in through the skull. The hardest thing here is just keeping your patience because this is a really delicate yet forceful procedure at the same time. It's a bizarre mixture of strength and patience. I can actually now move this tooth a little bit with my finger. All right, let's try a lift. Oh, that's tight. Whoa, Junior. We've now got it about an inch out of the socket, but the problem is this, this tooth is up to four inches long. To actually get it out inside the mouth is, is quite a task because it just won't fit to come out. So it's really trying to suck it back in, isn't yeah, it? You can hear, you can, you can hear that back in yeah. then. Go, baby, go. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, crap. Um, crap. Turn to pressure. Uh, we've just hit a little stumbling block in that we've raised the tooth out of the socket enough that unfortunately it's hitting the other teeth on the other side and it needs to come up along. I've got to somehow get it past these teeth on the other side and I'm not too sure how we're going to do that yet. The surgery has now been going for more than two hours. It's come a little bit at a time. Yeah. At last, the team's patience is finally paying off. Oh, yeah. Go, baby, go. Oh, it just keeps on coming, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh, wow. Oh, oh my goodness. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Sure is curved. Look at that. And you look at that there, inside that tiny skull, it, it, well the maths just doesn't yeah. add up and, and Coda's really yeah, paid the full price for that, that's yeah. incredible. This is the first tooth cleaned up, it's just absurdly large and this is enough to put the tooth fairy into liquidation, it's ridiculous. After another 30 minutes, the second tooth is ready for extraction. Well done. Here we go. Oh. Oh. Jeez, well done. It's a boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it there. Done. Well done, team. No, no, well done you. That yeah, was um, extraordinary. Great stuff. Now we've just got to put Coda back together. Yeah. Very happy. Yes. Yeah. No, all's gone swimmingly well. For me to be a part of this surgical team and actually take part in this operation for Coda is, is special. But to know that it is a life-saving procedure, it's really something. You just need to look at the faces of Lynchy and Karen to see the relief. We expect so much maturity of him, don't we? You forget that he's just a little baby. He's a tough little fella. He's a tough little fella. Made us all very proud, mate. Incredibly, Coder is back up on his feet only 15 minutes later. Take it slowly, man. But it will take him at least a month to fully recover. He's going to play the little tough guy and carry on as though he's in no pain at all, but he'd be feeling it right now. You're a remarkable little fella. He's a small little man, but he's had to become a big guy on the inside to go through and overcome all these hurdles. How's the patient this morning? He's doing really well. Yeah. He's got a little bit of swelling in his cheeks. Yep. So um, but his appetite's back and uh, we're really pleased with how he's going. Next day, Chris meets up with Andrew and Karen to check on Coda. Oh, look at you. How you doing? You okay? The check is there. No tooth under there, so tooth fairy's obviously <laughs> back. Yeah, tooth fairy's back. Yep. After his surgical ordeal, Coder is living up to his reputation as the Iron Horse. He looks like someone's had their wisdom teeth out, doesn't he? He does, yeah. He's got that real chipmunk look about his cheeks. Yeah. I've got to say, when you, you look at what he went through with that operation yesterday, it was, it was quite a forceful procedure, but true to Coder's nature, he bounces back, shakes it off, and away he goes. Back on track now, aren't you? Mm, nothing's going to stop you. More food? 
literally within an hour of the surgery, he was looking around for food, um, doing his old normal things, you know, sort of bumping up against us, wanting a scratch, being his old normal self. And I, I was just absolutely chuffed to see that. He's got a lot of character, Dakota. The dwarf horse, who is not meant to live longer than six months, will now be around for many more years. Dakota, just slow down, buddy. <laughs> a lot of kids look at Coda and they want one. He's a, he's a very cute little pet. Coda is not an ideal pet at all. I wouldn't encourage anyone to take on a pet like Coda unless they are specifically able to deal with the many health problems that his condition entails. Knock, knock. Only six weeks later, Coda is Morning, back on the round at you. Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital. I think he's very cute and he loves to see people, like to come and visit kids here at the hospital. I think he's nice and soft. Hopefully now the little horse's battle against chronic pain is finally over. He has been through a lot. He has been through significant periods of convalescence where he's had to overcome significant surgeries. So yeah, I think he can probably relate to the experience of being in hospital. I think he can continue doing his good work here. And he obviously uh, brings a smile to all the kids' faces here. It's, um, it's fantastic to see. <laughs> So the team's back together and we're hoping to have many good years together. I'm lucky enough to see animals every day of my life, but there aren't many that come along like Coda. He's the smallest horse in Australia, but he's one that's probably left the biggest mark on me. If you guys loved that video, great. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel below. That way.